Hello? Hello? Uh. Hi, Ron. How are you? I'm good. Who is that? This is Jesse. Hey, Jesse. How are you? I'm doing well. Hey, Ron. This is Shailene. How are you doing? Hey, Shailene. How are you doing? You know, I'm doing pretty good. Pretty good. Can't complain. I it's hope fall. you're doing well. It's, yeah. It's fall. I'll come alive again around <laughs> July. <laughs> July. Around July. I love the 5th. fall. Around I love July. The fall. So this is. July 5th. Okay. I feel that. I see that. I'll see you then. <laughs> I'm just wondering what kind of winter we're going to have. They're saying we're going to have a bad one. Uh, we have like an El Nino effect or some, something coming. Oh, I was reading something earlier that it's going to be cold and wet, like not, wetter than usual. Not La Nina again. That, yeah, that's what they're saying. So I was like, okay, I'm, I can, I know how to make hot toddies. I perfected the recipe last year. I'm good. I have twinkle lights, candles, hot toddies. I'm good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that will do the trick. Yeah, I'm worried about the people who are outside in this, are living outside in this. Yeah. Oh yeah, I wonder what the strategy will be. I I don't know. Well, it was 36 and raining last night, so I just know that that compounds it. But our cold weather shelters won't be up until 32. Mm. Can Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. I, I apologize, I'm having such technical difficulties today. Let's see here. Hold on one second. We're gonna get start. We're gonna get started in one moment. I bet it is. Okay, let's see here. Progress. Okay, here we go. I think. How is everybody tonight? Good. Good. Can you all hear me? See me? <laughs> I just want I, I want to thank. First of all, let me just say thank you all for being here. I appreciate your attention. Um, I'm excited about tonight so that we can learn and see 
how things are going. Um, we have an opportunity to answer any questions that anybody have about the monitoring team and what's going on with the consent decree. Thank you, thank you, Doctor, for being here tonight. I appreciate you, uh, Monisha, um, Ron, everybody. Um, I do want to just say housekeeping rules. I just want to say that anybody who has um, issues or want to, you know disrespect the, the the platform for tonight warning one please just be respectful to everybody that's speaking i ask um if you if you um if we have anybody who is disrespectful to the platform you get one warning the second warning is to mute your mute your mic the third one is to excuse you from the platform that's just the ground rules we all want to respect, hear, and listen and honor everybody's perspective. So that's that's just my that's just my number one ground rule. So with that being said, I do want to turn it over. This whole entire meeting is towards our monitoring team and and all of you who have questions, um, comments, anything that has to do with this consent, consent degree. And I appreciate you all for being here, Monisha. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad you're here. Um, doctor, would you, will you, are you ready? I certainly am. Okay, take it on. It's all yours. Well, uh, thank you so much, Felicia, for the, for the invitation and for having the, the monitoring team here with you all. Um, I'm Antonio Oftoli. Uh, met uh, quite a few of you, but uh, there's others here that we've probably been meeting for the first time. Um, it's just, on, it's really wonderful to be with you tonight um, and, and an honor. You guys are really on the on the front lines of everything uh, when it comes to the future of public safety and healthy and thriving communities in Seattle. And so we really, as a monitoring team, Onisha and Ron and I and the rest of the, the team behind the scenes, uh, we really need you right now for this work. Um, we cannot do this purely on our own. Uh, we have a lot of work to do and, and we need to collaborate with, with all of you, uh, not only to find the best ideas for the future, but also to, to dig in today, nowadays, to, um, to really look at what's happening and to, and to drive innovation and, and change and, and transformation overall. So uh, again, just really uh, wonderful to be here with you all. Um, the, uh, I thought what I could do, uh, Felicia, if, if it's okay with the group here, is I do have a, a small PowerPoint. It's just about seven slides, just to give a, a kind of a level set and an overview of, of where things uh, are at with the consent decree. Would that be helpful to people? Or if you know, if we get a bunch of thumbs down, we can we can just talk. If we get some thumbs up, we can do a little bit of an overview. Please, please go okay. right ahead. All right, I will see if I can uh, share my screen here and uh, pull this up. Yeah, wait for this to computer to bring the we'll get this in just a second here. Let me pull off this other monitor. Okay. Um, oh, now it disappeared. One second. I just have to say, Lawrence, I'm so glad to see you here. Lawrence Payne, thank you. Felicia, uh, able to see you, Felicia. All of uh... Uh, thanks. I just need to give, give this a second here to load this document up. While I'm waiting for the PowerPoint, um, uh, which my computer is having a hard time here with, uh, just uh, let's say uh, um, we are uh, towards, we are fully about a year into our work. So the new monitoring team. 
uh, came forward uh, in about November of last year. And so uh, myself and we have a Manisha, as you guys know, Manisha Carroll uh, and Ron Ward, uh, Matthew Barge is a member of the monitoring team as well. Uh, and so we've been uh, fully on um, working uh, for you all. So I think you guys can see the slides here. Uh, it's blank on my screen. Yes. They haven't quite rendered yet. And so we're uh, okay, waiting here for this thing to, to move along. Um, we've, uh, we've made, I think, some significant progress. We've uh, been working with the CPC uh, early on. One of the first things that I did when I came on board um, in, last fall was to really take, a, was to go on a listening tour. So uh, myself and uh, Monisha and Ron spent a good, um, really probably two or three months working directly with uh, with the CPC members, with other stakeholder groups, community groups, to really learn what the state of, of policing in Seattle was. Prior to that, we really didn't have a, an assessment of Seattle policing uh, for about two, or two years or so. So the previous monitor did some assessments. The last one, uh, I believe was in 2017 or so, uh, early 2018. Um, and that um, and we really went into a gap period after that. So we came in with the sole purpose of trying to um, level set again. Um, my main objective was just is, is really just to get this right for the for the citizens and the community members of Seattle. Uh, we know that it's been uh, quite a quite a while here that Seattle's been working under a consent decree. Um, and we've been trying to just really get a strong hold of, of how that's working and where we need to go uh, next uh, with that. Um, uh, can are these slides rendering for anyone? No, okay. Um, I'm wondering, Felicia, I sent these slides to you as well. Do you let's see? Have let, them me, them? let me try. So let me let me stop. My let me screen. let me try to go to my email and see if I can um, bring them up. My apologies on that, everyone. While Felicia is looking for that, um, why don't we? Just, I want to introduce the monitoring team. Maybe we can start uh, with Manisha. Do you want to give uh, give a hello to the group? Absolutely. Um, thank you so much for um, welcoming us here today and for giving us an opportunity to talk uh, directly with you. My name is Manisha Harrell. She her pronouns. Um, I come to the monitoring team uh, via other community work um, uh, in and around uh, policing and police accountability. Um, this, um, in 2018, I worked on uh, Deescalate Washington, which was Initiative 940. Um, that was the statewide initiative to require um, deescalation training for all law enforcement officers in Washington state. Um, that's a quick overview. It also um, removed uh, malice from um, lethal use of force, uh, the, that malice had to be proven uh, in order to be able to bring uh, a charge against a law enforcement officer also required um, the rendering of first aid as soon as safely possible um, if there was somebody who was injured um, in uh, an encounter with law enforcement and then also have been a part of organizations like the Washington uh, Coalition for Police Accountability, which brought forth a number of statewide initiative, a uh, number of statewide um, pieces of legislation this year, um, and uh, have been working with impacted families on a statewide level. Uh, but the monitor team is um, what I do on the local level here in Seattle, and uh, really just appreciate the opportunity to be a part of this uh, work and in this space. Thank you, Mr. Ron. I think you're on, you're on mute, Ron. Good evening. Thank you for welcoming us. My name is Ron Ward. I am a longtime Seattle personal injury and wrongful death attorney. I've been involved uh, 
with a consent decree since November of 2012, and have pretty much been present for every event, significant or otherwise, in every permutation of this uh, police reform process since the beginning. Uh, I served with a prior monitor up until about a year ago and was asked to join this second phase of the monitor team and uh, I'm continuing to do what I do, which is engage with, uh, with the community, which is a part of my role and uh, give counsel where appropriate to the other members of the team. Thanks again for having me. Looking forward to engaging this evening. Wonderful. Thanks, Ron. I think I, I think I saw the slides there, Felicia. And, you uh, did. There okay. we go. Right Great. there. Yeah. Got it. Um, We're in your email right now. Uh -oh. but, okay. Um, but it. But one of the um, selections is the slide deck. Is that it? There you go. Right there. Yep. <laughs> cool. Thank you. Okay, well, wonderful. I, some, so some of this information is, is the majority of us know, but I wanted to just you know, kind of go over it a bit for those uh, of you who, who might not uh, be fully familiar with it um, and, um, uh, and give just a, you know, kind of a flyover of, of where we're at with that. Um, so I think we lost the slides though. Okay, let's see. We had them for a second. <laughs> let's see, hold on. This is our modern world now. We're all we're right. all working remotely <laughs> Zoom and WebEx and Microsoft Teams. And it never it never goes fully smoothly anytime <laughs> we've tried to do that. For sure. For sure. Let's see. I'll get it back. Share slides. Go ahead. Go ahead, Doctor. I'll I'll um get them up. Great. What I can do is I can just kind of start uh, talking to him a bit and, and giving a slight overview on, on this. So the um, the as a baseline, people a lot of people will ask uh, three big questions. They'll say, "What you know? What is the Seattle consent decree?" Uh, they'll talk. They'll ask, "What's being worked on now?" So you know, what are we doing about this whole consent decree thing? And third, uh, generally, they'll say, um, "How does it finish? Uh, what what is the end point of this uh, as as we move through?" Uh, our work. And so at a top level, as, as again, as most of us know, this, the, the, uh, the settlement agreement, also known as consent decree, uh, was between the, uh, the city of Seattle and the U.S. Department of Justice. Uh, about 12 years ago or so, um, there was a pattern or practice investigation by the Department of Justice that was asked for by members of the community of Seattle. Uh, and that investigation by the Department of Justice found a pattern and practice of uh, non-constitutional policing uh, and excessive use of force by the Seattle Police Department. So what happens with that is generally uh, the DOJ, Department of Justice, will work with that city to say, well, one, we can uh, take you to court on this, um, or we can have some type of an agreement, settlement agreement. And uh, Seattle decided at that point in time that it'd be best to have a settlement agreement and we could uh, create a, a document, the consent decree, um, that outlines a series of steps with the goal of ensuring that policing services are delivered to the people of Seattle in a manner that fully complies with the Constitution and laws of the United States, effectively ensures public safety, uh, public and officer safety, and promotes public confidence. So that was entered into in 2012. So we're uh, just about 10 years uh, into that consent decree. Now, this, of course, um, consent decrees can be can be good in that it can bring leverage to a city to really try and. Uh, no, I got it in here. From the uh, did you did we find me? All right. It's so we get, there we go. Um, can we, so I, I am seeing the slides on the screen. Maybe we can go back to the, um, to the second slide. And or, or what we could do too, is we can, we can email this out as well. And I can just kind of talk to it if uh, <laughs> that might be an easier, an easier option. Um, so the, um, 
so it's we're going about 10 years uh, into this now which is which in some uh, ways feels like a long time but in in many others in comparison to other cities it's not it's generally uh you know a range of, of years that these these will go on but it brings an uh, an amount of leverage to the city to make bigger changes to policing um but also of course uh, there's federal oversight that's involved and so the consent decree uh and the which is uh, administered by uh, the U.S. Court for the Western District of Washington establishes a, a monitor and a monitoring team, uh, the team that's on uh, the call here with you today, uh, to work on the year-to-year -year and month-to-month -month and day-to-day -day of the consent decree. So um, on the next slide, which I guess some of you are seeing on the screen there, um, is what's being worked on. And so uh, as I mentioned before, we spent about three months or so getting up to speed and working with community and 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 uh, level setting to some degree on what was happening with the consent decree in Seattle. And from that created a 2021 uh, work plan. And it's really composed of two different elements. One is the monitoring plan, which is essentially the, the work that, uh, that myself and, and, uh, and Monisha and Ron and the other members of the team are, are working on day to day, as well as a methodology, uh, which is a set of measures for uh, for um, the Seattle Police Department. So the monitoring plan has is really broken into uh, pr three broad areas. Um, and you can also access this plan. I believe the CPC has it on their website as well as the, uh, the, the, uh, the monitor website, which is at Seattle. Uh, policemonitor.org uh, slash documents. You can find this uh, full uh, document there. Uh, but broadly, it looks at three areas. One is accountability. So really going to the core of what it means to have constitutional policing from an accountability standpoint. And importantly, they're both front end accountability, meaning what is Seattle Police Department doing now, along with its accountability partners to have policies that lead towards better uh, uh, services, better outcomes, constitutional policing before uh, an officer goes on the street, as well as back-end accountability. So if something does go wrong, uh, what's in place so that officers can learn from what happened, that the department can learn from what happened, and in instances where need be, where an officer may be disciplined uh, for, uh, for their actions. And so front-end and back-end accountability is very important to making sure that we have a sustainable a legitimate policing organization in Seattle. A, a big second component around that is uh, around tactical assistance that the monitoring team uh, uh, conducts with the Seattle Police Department in the city around innovation and risk. So things like the early intervention system, um, better you know, training systems, uh, areas around ABLE, which is the active bystandership for law enforcement program, things like that, that enable uh, just better policing overall, uh, we're offering technical assistance on, as well as technical assistance on reimagining public safety. So working with the mayor's office uh, and all other stakeholder groups around uh, parameters for looking at uh, what, the, <clears throat> excuse me, what the future may hold, alternative response and, and changes to uh, policing as a whole there. Um, there is a semi-annual report, which we released in uh, July or so, which you can find on the monitoring website. And then we'll have a 2021 annual report uh, that's pending. Uh, the annual report will be driven by the methodology that you see on the right part of that slide. What this really means is we're gonna go very rigorously to assess Seattle Police Department and its uh, its outcomes from a number of measuring points. Um, it's about a 15 page document when you look at the actual uh, methodology, but in a nutshell, what we're doing there is looking at four main areas. One uh, very importantly is use of force broadly across different categories. What's happening with force um, with Seattle police as they're uh, interacting with community members in, in the city. Um, a big part of that as well will be around crowd management as a kind of a subcomponent. Uh, we all know that 2020 was a pivotal year uh, in this country, and we had a lot of um, uh, protests and demonstrations and marches, et cetera, across the country, and particularly in Seattle. And so there was a lot to be learned from what happened um, uh, within those settings. And so we'll be looking directly at crowd management use of force as well. The second big area in the methodology is around crisis intervention. So what is Seattle Police Department doing now uh, in order to have better outcomes when it comes to their interactions with people uh, in crisis, particularly a mental health crisis? 
Uh, what are they doing to de-escalate situations, to, uh, to make sure that force is uh, the least amount necessary, uh, that they can partner better with the community and with other services to, to help someone in crisis, et cetera. So looking at the crisis intervention uh, aspect of Seattle Police. The third component is around stops and detentions. So when Seattle Police does uh, interact and uses their um, their ability to detain someone, um, is that constitutional? Does that person understand why that's happening? Uh, and is that being uh, done in an equitable way going forward? And lastly, looking at supervision, uh, some of the basics of management and supervision for the department to make sure that there are enough officers, enough super supervision to ensure that uh, police are learning, that they're being trained well, uh, that they're able to look at incidents and understand what happened uh, and adjust uh, course uh, going forward via policy. So those are the four major areas uh, in the methodology. Those will all be assessed via measures and will, will flow into that 2021 uh, annual report, uh, which uh, is uh, probably will land, and, and, and we're kind of guessing here, we're not quite sure when that's going to land, but um, we'll want to work directly with you all at CPC uh, on that timing. Um, we're probably, probably looking at somewhere in January, but we want to make sure that we bring everyone along in that journey, that we uh, uh, talk about what we're finding um, and have some dialogue and discussion, and then we'll put that uh, all on paper and submit that uh, those findings to the court in the form of that annual um, report. So if you go to the, um, the next slide, um, there are some interesting, um, I guess you call them early indicators or so, uh, particularly in things around um, crisis intervention. So one thing I, I definitely want to hope maybe we can have some dialogue tonight on is, is in across these areas um, that we're doing an assessment on, we will likely find areas that need some work, right? We'll say, okay, this is, uh, we have to do ongoing work in 2022 with the community, with CPC, with other stakeholders to, to shore some things up or to improve some categories. Um, there will also be areas where we'll find some really solid progress. And in those areas, we should all collectively decide on what happens with those. And I can get into more detail on that. But uh, for example, what we're finding initially, at least in these, uh, you know, this report again, will, will is being in, in process of being developed and we'll have this uh, done relatively soon and, and, and you know, fully on paper um, to submit to the federal court in, in January or so. Um, but in, as an interim example, as an early indicator, what's really going well is something um, in this area around crisis intervention. So when we look at the data going back over a couple of years here, what we're finding is that the Seattle Police Department is doing exceptionally well uh, in sustaining the progress they have had under the consent decree uh, when they're interacting with people in crisis. So for example, you can see some of the stats there. Uh, lethal force has been only in 0.01% of, of all contacts. Um, there was misconduct allegations in, in approximately 0.24%. And all of those, of course, have been um, addressed uh, by uh, OPA. Um, and this is in the context of about 10,000 uh, crisis contacts a year. And so when you think about the scope of that, um, the results and the outcomes have been quite exceptional in progress that SPD has had, in that they use force uh, in about 1.5% of those situations. Um, slightly higher level force uh, in less than 0.5 percent uh, of these contacts, and um, and uh, for those that received any complaints, um, OPA again has been reviewing those and and has been using those to help learn and to discipline and to help SPD figure out how they develop even better policies going forward. So some really solid progress and things like crisis intervention we're, we're seeing. In addition, uh, early indicators on, on uh, areas around stops and detentions are also pretty solid. Um, it appears that largely the, the measures have been sustained from the last time they were measured um, in that around the 90th percentile of stops are done constitutionally uh, the person that is being stopped understands why they were stopped. Um, there's a strong uh, process put in place uh, and measures around that. And so areas around stops and detentions are also looking uh, very good. That is also in the context, though, as we know, of Seattle Police Department on its own looking at 
how do we even get better uh, at bias-free policing over time? Uh, SPD has on its own engaged um, uh, other educational institutions and organizations to, um, to look at even uh, more measures around uh, bias and stops detentions, uh, and is using that to learn uh, what can be possibly made better and to make some adjustments going forward. So there are some of these areas that will collectively with you at CPC um, think about what do we do with these with the good areas in 2022. And it may be that we want to work with all the stakeholders, the city, uh, the Department of Justice, uh, and you all to say these areas should possibly be closed out of the consent decree. We could uh, submit to the court and the city would do a motion to the court to say there's been sustained compliance in these categories and we would like to close these out so we can then focus all of our efforts on the things that we and the areas that need more work uh, going forward. So that's a conversation we should all have on how we want to um, uh, manage, I guess, all of our workload and, um, and where we might want to go with the not only the things that need work, but the things that look really solid that we might be able to, uh, to close out on. Um, if you go to the next slide, uh, that connects a bit to when will the consent decree be finished. And that's often the, the first question people will ask me. Um, and so uh, the ending, so to say, the, the consent decree is really when uh, Department of Justice and the, and the city and the court will agree that Seattle Police Department and the city broadly has had sustained compliance in all the core areas of the consent decree. And so um, that compliance should be met and also that that compliance is sustainable over time so that the measures over years are showing progress and that uh, looks like it'll be sustainable over time. Looks like meaning that the structures, systems, the policies, processes, et cetera, are in place to ensure that that uh, progress uh, continues over time. Uh, when, when we get to that point, um, that will mean then that uh, this oversight of Seattle Police Department will return, rightly so, to the people of Seattle, to the community, to all of you. Um, that you'll be then in charge of making sure uh, that all of those mechanisms, those structures, those processes, um, that they are sustained and that they are innovated on um, and that they are, are producing outcomes over time. And so that end goal is to really empower uh, the community of Seattle uh, uh, to bring that transparency and accountability uh, in an ongoing way. Um, and uh, the next slide, uh, what would come after that is really um, you know, what does the future entail, but what could the future entail is, is really up to you. Um, but I think there's three big categories of work that will that will continue on, um, at least these three, once the consent decree is done and the monitoring team moves on. Uh, and, and that's the, the future should be when we hand it off, a transparent, accountable, trusted and legitimate policing organization. And that will mean it will be up to uh, this robust um, uh, system of accountability that we have, this triad of you guys, the Community Police Commission, the Office of the Inspector General and the Office of Police Accountability to be working really well together that triad in order to make sure that Seattle policing stays transparent, accountable, trusted and legitimate over time. And with that as well, there will be a continuous focus, we hope, on reimagining public safety. In particular, how can Seattle create an ecosystem of services, a kind of continuum of services that can get, that can operate more upstream to prevent violence from happening, to, uh, to uh, create better uh, conditions in communities that so people are healthy and safe, as well as downstream. How can you respond in, do, in new and different ways uh, to challenges that may happen in the public safety realm? So that development of that ecosystem, that alternative response, the new services going forward will be solely uh, driven by the people of Seattle, by the community of Seattle, uh, and directly by the uh, Seattle Community Police Commission. And so uh, we're hoping that we will get to that uh, that um, that soon. It's, um, it's unknown as to when directly the Seattle uh, consent decree will end, but but our goal with the monitoring team is to work with you to, to figure that out, to do this assessment this year, to decide um, if there are certain areas of the consent, consent decree that should be closed out, if there are areas we should keep open and keep pressing on, um, and creating a pathway forward so that we can close out the consent decree in coming months uh, effectively and efficiently 
uh, and legitimately and importantly with a, a very trusted policing organization. So I'll stop there with the, with this uh, with the slides. Uh, we I think Felicia, you can send these out if you want to, to people. And um, uh, but would love to engage in, in some dialogue on this. Any Q and A that you have, um, as well as uh, lean in on, on Monisha and Ron as well, if you want to to add in as we as we go forward here. Okay, so please um, raise your hands or put your. Um, we don't have comp. We will have chat on the next meeting, um, we've we revised our Zoom. So please raise your hand and I will call on you accordingly. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Artelli. That was great. Yeah, Reverend Walden there, I think has her hand up. Felicia, should we just go ahead and have Reverend yeah, Walden? Hi. Thank you. Um, I hope you can hear me I'm in my car, but um, I just have a question. I have a, several questions. I One, I came in a little late, but thank you for your grace. Um, is that I, and I'm, I'm trying to remember if it was stops in detention or either uh, bias uh, policing, is that African-Americans would still stop more in all of these cases. I mean, that there was, uh, in the last side uh, report, African-Americans would stop uh, more often than anyone else. And they were more likely to have a gun pointed at them than other people. So, I mean, did you, did you touch on that at, at all, or, or, or is that um, I was still working on that piece? Because that was something that I knew that we were going to be we were working on, but we might not have gotten all the way to that. But I know that that was a problem. Yeah, it's a fantastic question, Reverend, uh, and thank you for that. The um, it is it is it. Um, it I guess I'll answer that in two parts. Uh, one from the from the basic measures that the consent decree originally put out uh, around stops and detentions. Um, those sets of measures um, looking at the constitutionality of stops and detentions um, have been, so the, the previous monitor and measures found Seattle in compliance with that. And the early indicators of the assessment that we currently have on those basic measures also show that that progress has been sustained. That being said, number two is that if we look at this in more rigorous ways, um, and Seattle Police Department along with CPC has been doing that, uh, and I think you're uh, you're referring to the study that was done by the, uh, I'm drawing a blank on the name of the organization here, the um, Center for Policing Equity, I believe, is that right? Probably, yes. I think, I think that's the one. When they looked at the, the, uh, the Seattle population as a whole and, and looked at uh, bias policing, they did find certain troubling trends there. Um, uh, we, we probably won't tonight argue about their methodology on that, but I think what's most important is that they did find um, uh, er, you know, a lot of room for improvement uh, when it comes to bias-free policing. Uh, what's heartening here, I think, and good is that Seattle Police Department, along with the accountability partners, uh, in particular OIG as well, who's um, uh, leaning into this particular area to define some new measures and work with SPD on innovation in this area. They are, it's full, it's front and center with what they want to work on next. So one of the things we'll need to work on the monitoring team with, with CPC is figuring out for 2022 how we want to handle that. So if, for example, the, the baseline assessment that we have that's driven by the methodology that was originally part of the consent decree says SPD is doing well in that category, but we also know that via other measures that there is more work to be done, we'll need to make it a, a distinct decision on how you, the public, and via CP, and CPC want the federal monitoring team to be engaged in that going forward in 2022. So this is one of these areas where we want to have some rigorous discussion, and not only this meeting, but in subsequent ones to figure out where we uh, go next with that. So, so Reverend Walden, I, I'm still seeing uh, both progress there but also areas of concern. Um, and we'll really want to be looking at those areas of concern and developing a plan in 2022 um, on, on how to address that. Well, the other question that I have, or just a comment, is because when people, when, when the groups that brought the, uh, signed the letter to bring the DOJ to town, and uh, we had high hopes that we were going to really get some real strong police accountability and uh, I mean, and you know, I mean, we're going to get some things uh, and the state is going to give us more. Uh, and and I'm concerned that when this consent decree is uh, uh, is over, 
is that a lot of people in the African-American community is going to be wondering about what did we really get? I mean, I, I, what did, I mean, because for some people, accountability means something different. They mean that officers are being charged. Uh, the, the amount of, uh, you know, officers discharging their weapons are, is down. Uh, and, and, and so the measure of accountability from what the community is looking for is absolutely different in some ways that what is being ironed out in, in, uh, in the sustainment and in and, and, and the findings. Because now, I mean, I, I think, I think, I think that when all of this is over, I, I think the people in Seattle on some levels is going to wonder, uh, well, you know, you know, I mean, wonder, if you go down to sustainment, if you go down to findings, I mean, I think it was 10 of those. Um, and if you go down the list of the findings, I mean, I guess the biggest improvement outside of the places where, where the where the CIT really wasn't, uh, and, and the times when it failed, I mean, it looked like they had the most of uh, most uh, a, a lot of improvement. 2019, 10,000 calls, and all of those calls was handled properly. Nobody was harmed. We only know about CIT when somebody is harmed. I mean, and, and so if you look at CIT, which is in a Benton, and then you look at everything else. I, I I'm just I'm just concerned, and I'm speaking for Mothers for Police Accountability because we're one of the signatures. We've been working on this since 2010, and the untimely death of uh, of the of the woodcarver uh, uh, John T. William. In fact, they just they heard uh, his nephew just raised a poll uh, yesterday, an Indigenous Day uh, at Seattle Center, I uh, uh, and and uh, and respect I uh, I uh, uh, for Indigenous Day and also oh, respect. Yes. For the for the for the wood carver, so I'm just kind of concerned that um, that I don't think that you understand what people were looking for or what we were hoping to get out of this consent decree, and uh, I'll I'll stop at that. I mean, uh, for us who's been here for the long haul, actually we're absolutely disappointed on some levels. Yeah, and uh, let me. I'll, that we, so we could talk for a long time about that. I guess I'll just I'll respond and 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 Monisha Ron if you want to as well. But I I think what 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 is difficult with any consent decree um, across any city it's in, particularly you know we're here in Seattle, is that how you know how community views policing can sometimes be. It's hard to capture when it when it, um, or connect to some of the measures that that say the Department of Justice would use and the courts will use on constitutional policing. In fact, I've had a lot of people come to me and say, we don't care about constitutional policing because policing should just go away in general, right? And so managing how we all work together on that perception and reality around, you know, how measures and how we can use those to define success or, or not success of policing is gonna be really challenging, I think, for all of us. I think that a lot of the, the measures you know, if we look at crisis intervention, even the use of force broadly, excluding you know, if we take out uh, the crowd management in the, in the you know situation 2020, if you look kind of basic use of force, a lot of those trend lines have been have there's been huge progress made in the past decade. Now, all it takes is one incident in a community to make a community say none of this has worked, and, and and you know we're dissatisfied with that, and so we're you know we're going to have to figure out all of us as to how to find the right balance on that um, and to what degree the federal government should be involved in, in, in pursuing even more change versus CPC and the community driving that post-consent decree. So um, so a lot to talk about there, but uh, I know we have a lot of other hands up too and uh, uh, we can maybe go to some of the other ones. Um, Jesse, I'm gonna ask you to help me with this because I can't see all the screens. But um, Dr. Gale, if you want to go next, please. Uh, sure, thank you. Um, and I would just want to support and reiterate what Reverend Walden said. Um, and to highlight that, um, Dr. Aftelli, I'm not sure why you're using um, the SPD talking points. So you quote 10,000 10, contacts. Let's be clear, I looked at that data. Those are contacts, those are not calls. Those contacts mean when an officer went out. So for an individual call, there could be three to five officers. So that is a grossly inflated figure. My rough estimation is the number of calls is less than a third of that, number one. Number two, 
in what universe, whether it's medical or air transportation, do we say only one and a half percent, which is not an accurate figure. Like I said, it's an overinflated denominator. So it's something like four, five, six percent, which ends up in a use of force. In what universe do we say we only killed five percent of our patients on the operating table? We only had five percent of the passengers die in a collision. And again, I'm going to ask, why are you quoting SBD disinformation? So I'm not going to stay on for very long here, but I do want to ask, um, it's been seven and a half, it's been over seven and a half years of trying to do measurements for the monitor. Merrick Bob left. You are now here for one full year. Let's deal with real measurements. PoliceScorecard.org is the only entity that I know of that actually does objective measurements across police departments in the US. They rate us well below the media. In some cases, we are among the worst. And again, we have more people that have been killed by the police after John T. Williams than before. That was the whole point of bringing in the monitor and the DOJ. So I could go on, but I also do wanna ask, maybe we'll save this for later, but I would like you to respond in the context of the discussion we're having now, um, how you see Seattle policing in the context of the, of the very well-researched Seton Hall Law Review that was published in 2016. Since you're an expert on policing, I'm sure you're well aware of that. I'd like to actually take a few minutes to talk about that maybe later. Sure, so uh, thank you, Dr. Gale, for that. So I, so two, two responses to that. One is the, um, the measures that we're using uh, are, are have to be you know, cross compared to the previous monitors. So for sustainability, we have to, to look at sustained progress. We're looking at some of the same measures. So we're going back in time and, and comparing to the <laughs> uh, Two though is I, you know, I think uh, the issues you're raising and how we measure is extremely important. And so in, in as we're looking at methodology, um, what would be fantastic is to have more engagement from, from CPC and maybe directly from you, Dr. Gale, to, to work with our team to develop new sets of measures. Um, I think once we have the baseline assessment from looking at you know, the previous methodologies and making sure we can, we can sync up with those and compare to the previous monitor, what we could then do collectively as a city, as a community, is to say, what are the other sets of measures that we feel would be better suited to understand what's really happening? And so um, even going into, uh, not, not sure if I'd say this year, because we're already <laughs> in the middle of October here, but as we set up 2022, um, having you involved with uh, CPC and the monitoring team to develop some, some new measures, I think would be very welcome. Because um, bottom line is what we want to do with this is to make sure that to the degree we can, as, as, as somewhat of a outsiders being a monitoring team, even though we're based, some of us are based in the community, is to have this as legitimate as possible, right? So that, so that CPC and the community members can say, not only, hey, does this look good or does it looks bad or we have to do some more work here, but, but looking at what types of measures we have to actually make those judgments, right? And so, from, you know, a lot of these measures that were developed under the consent decree are now, they're 10 years old, right? And so the world has moved. We need to figure out how to move the measures as well going forward, but also not put the city of Seattle in a position of never having uh, an understanding of how to end a consent decree, right? So, so we could work together, even, you know, particularly going into next year to figure out how do we kind of thread that needle, right? Because if, if you, Dr. Gale, and we work together in developing a whole new set of measures, those would have to be approved by DOJ, by the court, and it could fundamentally change you know, the goalposts, say, of, of how this thing ends. My, my, my gut sense is that I would rather, in many ways, you know, have the measures for the consent decree and then say, what do we do as a community beyond the consent decree, beyond the monitoring team, uh, via CPC, OIG, and OPA to have new sets of measures going forward. Um, but, I mean, but we, you know, but if, if the collective movement is in 2022, let's have the federal monitoring team have designed new sets of measures. I, uh, you know, uh, speaking for Manisha and Ron, I think we would be, you know, we would, 
definitely want to have those conversations and move forward with that. So um, would love and would, would really like to have your engagement on that. Thank you. Um, Sam, could you please mute your mic? We're getting background feed from you and I can't figure it. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, Dr. Yell, I hope that answered or sufficed your question. Um, we'll go next to Jennifer. Thank you very much. Um, so I guess, you know, um, when my camera's not working, okay. Um, so I guess I feel like in hearing this presentation, I'm maybe living in an alternate reality in some respects. And the, the critical thinking component here is where I'm really going to focus, but I'd also like to connect that to the broader CPC work over the, over the, the years. So first, if these measures were you know, analyzed out of consistency, then as an outsider, where's the critical thinking component that says these measures are outdated? Here are some new measures that we would suggest with our fresh eyes and those of us that are community members understanding the development of the community over time would suggest, right? Um, I don't think it takes necessarily um, special measures to come up with those things, right? And to connect that to the broader issue of the CPC, Time and again, I think the CPC has missed this opportunity, which is to critically question, to critically think about you know, reports that OPA Director Meyerberg gives. There are assumptions made, but they aren't questioned, right? Um, you know, if we think about this in healthcare, which is where I come from, if I knew as a staff interpreter that the OR was doing the wrong surgery or on the wrong party part, I would have an obligation to sound the alarms from every angle possible. I wouldn't necessarily be able to say, well, there's an ongoing ethics investigation, can't really say anything. People's lives are at stake. And furthermore, to look at these figures and to say that, okay, 10,000 is the number we're really looking at. And it's 0.5% of the time people die. Well, for every one of those people, that makes no difference. And I can assure you that the, the protests of last summer, the marches from across Seattle were not done only for the death of George Floyd, for Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, uh, Elijah McClain and others. They were also because people like Terry Caver were killed, Sean Furr, um, Andre Taylor's brother, Shay Taylor, um, women, a number of women with, with only knives. I mean, I, my name, uh, their names are blanking for the moment because I'm so upset that this is, this is the one incident that gets this, the SPD looking bad. It's not one incident. It's any number of incidents where people's lives are lost and that marching wasn't for one thing. So I think we have to consider the broad context without cherry picking those numbers and those incidents and also include that critical thinking component that must question and vigorously advocate. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that, Jennifer. And just, I think the brief response to that is that um, the, the consent decree and you know, the monitoring and the assessment around that is like the baseline, right? So we really do need CPC to engage and to collaborate, not, not even just with the monitoring team, but just you know, across the entire ecosystem of partners to say, what do we do on, you know, on top of the consent decree, right? On, on top of those assessments and measures. You know, it's just, the baseline is not acceptable when it comes to just you know, with legitimacy over time and a trusted policing organization, right? You need as a community to say, what, what's that? What that? What's that higher level threshold that we need to have? And let's create, uh, you know, measures and accountability around that as well. And so, engagement by the CPC is is uh, you know, hugely needed in this in this area. So, Jennifer, let me just say this: um, you know, CPC has had a lot of transition. And I am the director now of community engagement and I, I welcome your input. You can email me, I will follow up. Um, and, I, and I welcome your engagement in these meetings. The meetings will be on, on schedule. 
every second um, Tuesday of the month, and um, which which hasn't happened on a regular basis in the past. But just just as the Dr. Otelli has just said, it is important that we have the the voice and the the um, comments and the opinions of the community. And we haven't had that in the past to this level, but I'm dedicated to it because I am a long lifetime member of this community. And so I appreciate your comments and I do welcome, welcome your insight and your input. So please don't let this be the last. Um, email me directly. I will um, do the follow-up. I'm dedicated to that. And, and that is my, 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 um, my actual, you know, quest to you. So thank you for your comments and thank you, doc, Dr. Atelli, for um, your response. And, 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 uh, and, mm -hmm. and please, just, just one more augment to that is just the, you know, when I say a, a baseline, right, the Department of Justice looks, looks at this from this baseline of constitutional policing, right, mm -hmm. and some basic measures around that. And that to me is just a start, right? But it's but but the, the monitoring team is also in many ways our we're, we're, our confine is those measures that are that constitutional policing as defined by DOJ. In order for Seattle to have better policing going forward, legitimate, trusted, we have to go way beyond that, right? Uh, the the community does, CPC does, right? To say yes, constitutional policing. That's just we have to have that, right? <laughs> What else do we have to have to make this legitimate? And those measures, those metrics, those values, the culture that are embedded in that above that threshold are uh, still have to be articulated by the community and, and rigorously uh, develop policy around and measured. And um, again, that's where CPC really needs to lean in. And, and Felicia, the, you know, again, to, to your, your comments there, this is now, I think, a point yeah. in time where CPC is, is formulated in a way that can really drive this. And so um, leaning in and stepping into that role is critical. Yes, thank you. Felicia, before we get too far, I just wanted to maybe add just a, um, yes. a, a little bit. Um, sure. Antonio is doing a, a great job, but um, I, I just want to, I don't want to go too far into the conversation and then not, and then uh, have to go all the way back. So I just wanted to start with a, with a couple things. Um, one, I wanted to just kind of address just a couple of things um, mm -hmm. that Reverend Walden had brought up, which was um, the consent decree is admittedly, it's, um, it's a blunt tool. Um, and it is also, also, just very clear, I think Antonio has mentioned that society, we, we've made many advances since um, 2012. And so um, in many ways, the consent decree is a bit of a historic document where if we are um, seeing that as the final goal, um, we are gonna be stuck. Um, we're gonna be stuck a generation in the past. So we really have to look past um, the consent decree in terms of um, what, uh, what our future as a, as a community is. Um, with Dr. Gale, I wanted to just mention very briefly um, that we have had some talks about methodology and numbers. And I think a place that we should also be looking at because it, it also, um, SPD is also responsible for um, meeting the guidelines for state legislation that was passed this year. And so I would, uh, I know uh, Dr. Gale probably knows this, but um, there was legislation passed earlier this year that would require the collection of certain data from all police departments across the state. Um, SPD um, will be in compliance with that data collection as well. And so if the denominators are, are off, um, that is a great place during during that continued rulemaking phase to ensure that the data is collected correctly there um, because uh, not, that's not only just Seattle, but that's going to be the new standard statewide. And I think it's really important to get that right. Um, and I think that that's a, um, if, if and when the consent decree goes away, that's the tool that's going to be left for the access of this data on a regular basis. And so I would encourage everybody to 
um, make sure that those advances that are made are not being ignored because they will set the precedent going forward. And then Jennifer, I just wanted to, sorry, I'm catching up with all the comments, <laughs> but Jennifer, I just wanted to, um, I wanted to just kind of uh, add to that the methodology that the, um, that the monitoring team comes up with or that we work on, it, it goes forward to all of the, um, to all three legs of the, of the partner stool. And so there is always an opportunity to review those. We do present those um, publicly in CPC meetings. And this has been an, an unusual year for a lot of, a lot of change um, in and around the CPC, but we will continue to bring that methodology to the CPC and we welcome um, community input and oversight on that. Um, and just going back to an earlier point, it's important to understand that, that what this legal agreement, the consent decree, this historic document and blunt tool, what it covers and what it doesn't cover. The important part with the CPC is not only that we're looking at the past, that we're not only looking at this historic document, but that we are looking at what the future is because when the monitor team leaves, this work will lie in the hands of the CPC and the CPC shouldn't focus all of their work and all of their energy on just what is done in the past, but they have to also be looking at what is going to be in the future because when the monitor team hands this all over, that will be the next blueprint. And so in some ways there's this element of, we're gonna to have to walk and chew gum on several issues, which means we're gonna to have to start thinking about what are the things that we need to do outside of the consent decree as it ages and becomes that historic document that we leave behind, but we continue to look at the work uh, that needs to be done going forward. I think the CPC actually has done a pretty fantastic job of, of uh, beginning to look forward. Um, they had a lot of advocacy on the statewide legislation this year that, that will make quite candidly, some of the consent decree even more obsolete, uh, which is wonderful. And so um, I wanna thank everybody for those comments so far, but I just wanted to kind of catch up with my, uh, what I wanted to share with everybody um, as well. And, and Felicia, I'll hand it back over to you. Thank you so much, Manisha. And please don't, don't hesitate to, um, you know, chime in because this is what this meeting is about. I know we haven't had these type of meetings in the past, but I encourage all the engagement from everybody um, because this is where we get our answers. And this is what, this is the blueprint, right? Because um, the mo monitoring team is not going to be here forever. So we have to know how to move forward. So I appreciate everybody's input. Um, with that being said, we're gonna, I have next on, on my screen, uh, Jeremiah, if you wanna go for it. Hi, thank you. Um, yeah, so I had um, a question and a comment. Um, I'm largely working off the 2018 crisis response report. Um, but one of the things that struck me is how disproportionate the calls were. Of course, there are several downtown for crisis response and then on the north side. But I noticed that in the south and the southwest, the percentage of calls that were for crisis response really dropped down a lot. And uh, what that says to me initially is that we are not having the same cultural response to all calls or all disturbances are not being analyzed properly to see if it's a mental health crisis or not. So um, these are things that I have a question about. Mental health stigma functions differently, both outside and inside. But I really wanted to know what's being done to make sure that if there is a crisis, regardless of color or language or any other barriers, SPD is equipped to be able to see past their own biases in those areas and treat it like a medical response that needs that it's what it needs. That's a, a fantastic question, Jeremiah, that I, I don't have a, a solid answer for right now, but I think that we can definitely take that back as a monitoring team. and. Uh, work with well all, well, all of you and the accountability partners, but more, but directly SPD to ask about that. Um, there is, I think, a um, in, 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 I guess, a set of things around process uh, and documentation, uh, as well as upstream and things like dispatch, which are uh, which uh, which affect what you're asking about. I think, and so that's a really interesting question. Um, and we'll we'll write that down, and we'll. Uh, 
Uh, maybe Felicia, you can help us to circle back around maybe our next call with that and see if we can find some answers there. Yes. Right. Also, uh, Jeremiah, I have actually been in contact with our crisis intervention team to um, see about coordinating a one of these meetings to talk about the work that they do, the process, the procedure, and um, you know some of some of the information needed. Um, that maybe some of the our regular citizens don't don't know. So um, that just gives me another um, another uh, spike to go ahead and and have them come on in. So please stay tuned. Uh, um, if I don't have your email address, I don't know how you received the message today, but will you please email me so that I can make sure to put you uh, on our email list? Um, Absolutely. Um, yes. I'm with the National Alliance on Mental Illness, so that's okay. how uh, that's how I got your your info. But I can send you that, and I'll connect you with our executive director as well. Please, to get it. please do, please do, mm -hmm. because um, that is a, a whole lot of the part of uh, my mission and my goal with these meetings is to bring the the uh, you know the information from the department of how they the policies the procedures so that we can go from an educated view of how to make adjustments <laughs> you know where where need be from an educated view uh, of what they're being taught and and so um there's a lot of work being put in with CIT with the crisis intervention team and I know that because I've taken their courses um, and and so I, I appreciate your question. I appreciate your input, and um, I am dedicated to reaching back around with you with with Dr. Oftelli. Yeah. And, and Jeremiah, it'd be great if you could actually send your exact question to me. Or to, I know Manish and Ron and I have been trying to take notes, but would love if you can connect with us via email and send us that exact question. Um, that would be helpful. Or, or maybe you can connect with me. Okay, thanks. Yeah. I wanted to just add one thing to mm -hmm. Jeremiah's question, which is, um, you know, it is it is very possible that the numbers are not lower because of lack of reporting, but the numbers could be lower because of lack of calling. Mm -hmm. And we have to acknowledge the fact that um, in working with a number of impacted families, if they have a family member who is in mental health crisis, they may be hesitant to call law enforcement because they fear the response. Mm -hmm. um, and we have to continue building trust in community. We have to continue to um, build a system in which people don't have to weigh the option of, do I call because I could be putting them in danger? So we have to just acknowledge that culturally there, there could be people, there are people I know, who don't call for fear of a harmful outcome to their loved one. And so they have to wait and see how far that crisis will go yeah. before they make a decision to call. Mm -hmm. um, that's, part of the, that's part of the problem and as part of the solution that we need to work on. 30% um, of people um, in Washington state who are, um, um, who are killed, um, by law enforcement are in mental health crisis. Um, mental health crisis should not be, um, should not increase your chances. It should not be a reason that somebody um, loses their life. So there's a lot that we have to do there. And it's certainly, I think that the impacts culturally, we just have to acknowledge the numbers may be different in the city because um, we know that there are some families that will fear making that call. Um, so I want to I want to thank you for your question. And um, and there's no one solution. The, the way we make it better, the pathway we have to making it better, is for people to feel secure that if they do make that call, their loved one will make it out alive. Um, and so that requires a building of of different trust and different systems uh, in some ways. And so um, thank you for bringing that up, though. Absolutely. Thanks for hearing me. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Alicia. Just... And thank you, Jeremiah, as well, because um, I've had several conversations with law enforcement officers around this particular subject. And, you know, they they feel helpless as well. So, um, yes, this is an area that we do need to address. 
Uh, Ron, I want you to be able to, you know, chime in, chime in where you feel necessary. You don't have to raise your hand. I want to acknowledge our monitoring team. You were invited, you're our guest, and we want to hear from you. So please go ahead. You're, you're, you're muted. Hi, <clears throat> Jeremy, great question uh, and a matter for real concern. I just want to point out that uh, with the evolution of this process, certain very positive things have occurred. Uh, we are now in the midst of a restructuring with regard to responses. Part of that will be separation of the 911 system and a far more sophisticated system, which will be able to make uh, more precise decisions as to what resources should be directed to what particular circumstances or emergencies, if that is the case. Uh, I think that that in and of itself, to the degree that mental health professionals may directed, be directed to the scene at the outset when the call was made, in and of itself will be a very positive uh, occurrence in those situations. Um, it was mentioned earlier that um, the statistics and the measurements with regard to uh, issues involving CIT may not be accurate. We're not really in a position to dive into the weeds on that tonight, but I would note that regardless of the number of, con of contacts, uh, I do not recall uh, with those CIT contacts uh, any uh, negative outcomes. Uh, I think that CIT uh, stands out uh, over the course of the consent decree as really being something that has evolved and become a much more uh, positive element in this whole in this whole area of questions and the quest for solutions. Thank you, Ron. Um, Valerie, you you're next on my list. Hi, thank you, Felicia. Um, we've been, there's been some discussion about um, getting out of the consent decree and measurements of progress. And I would just like to say from, I would like to stand up for uh, what ordinary people in Seattle can see if they're paying attention is a measurement that um, is completely untechnical, which is numbers of people killed by SPD in the decade or so since the consent decree and in the same number of years before the consent decree. And uh, it's actually more, 31 people killed by SPD since the consent decree, 14 of them not armed with guns, only armed with knives, broken bottles or nothing. I want to uh, thank Jennifer for her comments and just um, say the name of Charlena Lyles. Charlena Lyles was the young mother who was shot by SPD in her home when she called when she was apparently having a mental health crisis. And we've had no justice or accountability for that shooting. And it, it's, you know, when you think about that, it's been four years. Um, that seems indicative of our whole situation in the city. We, you know, there's a, a, an outcry sometimes for a police killing like that. Not all the time, but sometimes there's an outcry and much discussion and yet no real accountability. And so as members of the public, we don't see any real change. Um, added to that, there are other things. Well, we can see videos online of shootings that appear to have been unnecessary, like the shooting of Terry Caver. Uh, but I'll also say we can also watch what happened at the protests in the summer of 2020. N numerous, numerous occasions of real egregious police abuse that was unnecessary, some of which left people with permanent injuries, lifelong injuries. And we don't hear a discussion about this in among people in power and people who have a platform that seems to be commensurate with 
the amount of harm done and we don't see real accountability. So we don't see our police force changing. Um, we could really use some help if we are stuck in a consent decree process, then to a certain degree, we have to ask the DOJ and the court monitor to help us with this, help, help us figure out how to make our accountability system work because it is not working. It is, we are supporting it at the cost of about $10 million a year. And that, that's, it, it serves just as a cover up for anything the police do is basically okay or results in a really pretty minor discipline. And I can't see how we get to real change and real just policing with the current system that we have. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Valerie. Is there a comment from one of our monitoring teams if... Um, I'd like to just add one thing, Valerie, mm -hmm. um, absolutely um, hear everything you're, you're stating on that, but want to just level set and kind of clarify on one thing, which is we actually don't know accurate numbers for past deaths. Um, I've asked this question many times in many departments and on many different mm -hmm. levels. Um, and it's one of the reasons that the... Um, the legislation uh, was passed this year on a statewide level to centralize data and data reporting. This state actually doesn't have accurate data on um, lethal use of force because it's not something that we have ever been required to collect. We pay more, more attention to it now um, because we have cameras, because we have social media, because people tell their stories. But, um, but those numbers uh, that there are more now um, likely are not truly accurate. It's just, we now capture it. So I wanna, I wanna acknowledge what you're saying. Um, and I also just wanna, just wanna also acknowledge the fact that we are seeing more of it. It's not that this is the first time it's been happening um, that uh, we know by, by stories within community that it's been happening for a long time and um, and that we just now have reports and data and cameras that capture something that um, that we've had going on for um, many decades. So I want to I want to thank you for what you're saying and but just also add that the, what we know, the data that we have now um, is is a new part of the equation. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Valerie. Thank you, Monisha. Um, Valerie, please, I, I, I can't say enough. Um, I'm going to work on trying to see when I can get the crisis intervention team here to our next meeting or, or you know, to one of our future meetings because they also can uh, shed a, a, a whole lot of light on um, the subject that you're talking about. And it is, it's relevant is very relevant, is not to be downplayed. And so I thank you for your input. I thank you for your participation. Thank you, Monisha. Um, I see well, next. Yeah, Felicia, I, just one, one more thing yeah, to on that, on yeah, that sure. Valerie. Th mm -hmm. Thank you for that, because I, I think the what's challenging sometimes for, for me and the monitoring team is we're working on these systemic system level things, right? And, you know, it it, it, it hurt, it, I'm just honestly, it, like it hurts my heart when mm -hmm. I, hear individual names, right? I, I mean, I, I I live in South Minneapolis most of the time, uh, just a few blocks away from where George Floyd was murdered, right? You guys all in Seattle, you have the people you've known that have been, uh, that have been harmed, that have uh, been killed, whatever it may be. Uh, one thing that I just, maybe this sounds a little bit ridiculous, I don't even know if this is my purview, but I think it's, I would just even personally like to see and professionally as a monitor, if we had a list of, of all these people and looked at what happened in the accountability system with them. Because one thing I don't know is that what happened at every level through the accountability system 
yeah. SPD and the OPA and what happened from a disciplinary perspective. If there are cases where they are stuck in the system that OPA has not put out a finding or we feel like there was egregious errors that OPA had in that finding, um, I don't know, it's not directly under my purview to look at, but, but we should probably all do that, right? To document what, um, if there are problems in that accountability system. Um, some of these problems, of course, you know, are gonna run into federal laws, they're gonna run into state laws, whatever it may be. But nonetheless, if we could make sure that we have that list, you know, at the end of this consent decree to be able to at least say, out of, you know, if we had these number of deaths over the past decade, yeah. here's what happened with each one of them. And here's what happened with the accountability system. And for sure, if there was something wrong in the accountability system, uh, not that we would all agree on every outcome, but if there's something egregiously wrong, an error, a systemic problem, we need to know that. And we need to fix that because this is never going to work if we don't have that fixed. And so maybe Felicia, what we could do with this group too, is to have is just to do a little walk backwards in time and, and, and make a list of these cases just to make sure that we all collectively here are all in the same understanding of where those cases are, what happened and why and what the disciplinary uh, outcome was, if any, um, so we can figure that out. Because I, you know, it, it, court, when I go back to the court and say, hey, here's some good stuff that's happened, here's bad things that happened. Mm -hmm. And one of you says, well, what about this case? This person was you know, in crisis and was murdered in their home, that's going to be an issue, right? And that we need to all collectively solve and figure out, you know, what happened, how it never happens again, and how the accountability system worked around that. So I, I think at a very granular level, if we can, if we can have that list, and we can all work on that, that would be um, just, you know, good for all of us. Sounds good. I, I, I'm sorry, I'm going to interject yeah. here. Wait, and, just, just a second, Dr. Dr. Gill. Um, Jesse, is that something you can help me with? I'm, I, I know I'm putting you on the spot, but I'm just wondering if, because I know you keep a lot of those statistics. Is that something that you can help me to compile that list? Hey, Felicia, I think Jesse had to step out for a minute. Okay. Okay, so we, we'll get that information to I, you. I, I hate but to that's interrupt, a great but, that's a great yeah. um comment. Okay, uh go quickly, Dr. Gill. I'm gonna go I very a quickly. A lot of questions. I, I, and I would not disrespect the order, but this is absolute you. this is absolute gaslighting, and mm -hmm. I object to that. So let's be clear. Yes. First of all, Manisha, you've confused and confabulated state statistics with city statistics. Since 2010, the SPD keeps a very accurate database of shots fired. Through the shots fired, you can actually trace every individual death. That has been posted on the seattlestop.org uh, website, and it's also posted on my blog, and I can give that to you now. But let's really get to the heart. In 2020, January of 2020, the prior director of the CPC, Bessie Scott, asked me for a list of these names and said there would be an investigation. That never happened. The okay. names have been available and the names have been out there. And let me just take 30 more seconds to point yes. this out. Go ahead. The CPC has listened to the OPA explained the killing of Ayoseo Falatogo. They did not read the report and they did not object. Then when it came to the killing of, um, uh, of, of uh, Ryan Smith, again, they, they were silent. The, the report of Terry Caver just came out. The CPC is fully aware of this. The fact that the monitor is not aware of this is shocking and shows that this is really pointless. Yeah, no, I, let, me just, let me just clarify a little bit here, Dr. Gill. I think what, what I've heard, and I get Twitter messages, I get a few emails on this, is cases that have not been reported. Right, whether they're real or perceived or they're whatever it may be, if they're real, we need those. If someone says, "Hey, SPD shot someone and they're dead," and and OPA doesn't know about it, it hasn't been reported. All like documented. There, All right? documented. So, so Dr. Gill, let me just say this to you. Um, I just came on CPC since uh, April, <clears throat> and I've listened to your comments with the public comments. And, and um, uh, whether you know it or not, I've advocated to hear your voice because whether we agree or disagree, we still need to know the, the sentiments of, the, of our community 
and address and validate. Um, so I'm asking you personally from Felicia Cross, not as the directors of uh, community engagement, I'm asking you personally, um, I am really in inquisitive of your statistics and, and your, your stance and, your, and where you're coming from, because I don't discount any community member who takes the time out of their busy schedule, we all have busy schedules, and you're, you have been consistent and driven. And so I don't discount that. I want you to, I want to acknowledge that and, and to let you know that. And so what I want to say to you is without the venom, I want to hear your voice. I want to hear where you're coming from. I want to hear your points of view. I want to investigate and, and um, you know, take some leeway on some of the things that you have pointed out that I've listened to. I've heard you. I'm, I, I, I try to listen to you as much as possible. And so um, please understand, I want you to come to these meetings. I want to hear your voice. I want to hear your concerns. But um, I need to be able to understand and articulate and be able to give back to you um, the comment, you know, the, 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 but I need you to be receptive and, and seems, that, seems like you have been, but I, um, I want to work with you. And so um, that's what I offer. That's what I offer as the director of community engagement, because this is our city. And, it, you know, we're not all going to agree. <laughs> we're not all going to agree on a whole lot of things, but we can uh, agree to try to make it work. work. So um, please, uh, thank you. I appreciate your, 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 your candor. Um, we're going to move on to the next question and 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 you can always email me email me let's let's have a conversation i will follow up uh julia you've been waiting for some time mm -hmm. for acknowledging that uh i would have most gladly and welcomely given all of my time and space to dr gail uh and his uh expertise and very uh, informed uh, position and contributions to that. I, I could listen uh, to him more easily than I could have to a lot of other people, to be honest. Um, frankly speaking, I am in shock tonight. I'm in just absolute shock. I, I have no idea what's going on. Just like um, Jennifer, uh, this is a twilight zone for me. And when I say me, I say, uh, I'm the co-chair of the Seattle Human Rights Commission. And this is an astounding absence of the word racism. I have heard very little reference to what constitutional policing means. Whose constitution does not include our civil rights? Are we talking about a different constitution here? Uh, or is there some reference in the Constitution to policing that I'm not aware of? Because in my understanding of the history of equity and the history of policing in the United States, I know, I know for a fact this whole entire setup was a result of slave catching, hands down, to protect property. So how has that evolved over these how many years? I can't even, I, I don't even want to wrap my brain around how that has evolved into this, what we see right now. Is this not understood as the whole basis and context of this conversation? That this is a gross act of inequity? We are not euphemisms. That 0.01% has struck a very deep chord tonight. We are not statistics. We are human beings and that 0.01% is a whole family. That is a whole lifeline. That is their whole connection to their future as they have been connected to their ancestors. And we talk about this using such casual words. I can't even make my hand write it. I am so disgusted. How far away have we gotten exactly from our humanity 
that we are talking about these things in such a manner. You're I'm right. disgusted. My I'm patience is, I'm sorry, I have not heard anybody else be interrupted tonight. I'm not interrupting you. I hear you. I'm, I'm, I'm acknowledging. I'm a, I don't want to lose my train of thought. And Felicia, mm -hmm. I wanted to say, and I'm getting to it. The one thing that I have noticed even about our time and space here tonight in the in the light of engagement and equity you know i have i have i have timer i gave up because i'm trying to track how much air time has been given to the community mm -hmm. and how much air time has been given to those who we are trying to tell does every single one of our responses require three four five well here here's where i almost lost here's where i almost got my first warning after Jennifer had said and reminded us in this space of the humanity of Charlena Lyles, pregnant, shot to death in her own home in front of children, I just, I, I was trying so hard to mentally prepare myself to hear yet another series of, well, yes, that's true, but I was, it was all I could do to keep my level of respect and not interrupt your processes. But you know what, that's that right, that hurt me. Uh -huh. You think that we care equally as much about data as you do when we are not even the ones whose questions are being answered. Honestly, I give this much about data unless the questions are coming from me. I really don't care. All I need to understand, no, you know what? If we have to go back to basics, if we have to understand what that baseline is mm -hmm. before moving, I am perfectly fine with that. You know why? Because we have already died and suffered to have things written in the baseline, in our, in our constitution, in our civil rights amendments. We have already done that work to establish a baseline. Mm -hmm. We need to go back to it. What is in question here is not the baseline. It is the application of it. Mm -hmm. There's no need to discuss civil rights anymore. That's already been written. What I am most interested in is getting rid of this disgusting feeling that somehow the, the modern version of slave catchers whose main priority is to protect property. It's not to protect. Where, where, where in, 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 in any police handbook does it say here is how you protect and here is how you serve. Uh, I, I, I'm not getting into the details. I'm a newcomer. I am surrounded by experts in this area. But as a person of the public, mm -hmm. as a newcomer to the one who has, who has the, the one who, whom you should be protecting and serving. So as, I, want, I want you. I'm almost done. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm, I'm very glad you let me continue, Miss Felicia Cross, because yes. it, it has to do with you, my dear sister. We well, are just you, you need to know, I, I have just as much passion and concern and care. Oh, I know. And let, let me say it with my own mouth, please. What I am most excited about and the only reason why I would I would drag my 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 tired soul here tonight is because I'm inspired by women like you, Felicia Cross. Thank you. Uh, and the fact that we, both of us are new in our leadership positions yes. as black women, as people who have been, who are the community, it is my intention and I am optimistic and nothing but determined to use all of the power and compassion that we have learned via firsthand experience, what it means to fear. Mm. We use that information to guide our policies. And so when we're telling you, city, mm -hmm. state, nation, what we need, it's not an ask. We need to overcome this mentality. It is not an ask. Mm -hmm. We know the benefits of crisis intervention teams. This is how you have learned these things by asking us. Now the time has come, there's no more asking. You've already been told yes. for decades by multiple voices in multiple platforms. There is literally no excuse. 
Now the job is to do what we tell you to figure it out. I yeah. really, we are the common, we are the common people. We're not supposed to be expected to learn how to craft and navigate all of these bureaucracies and institutions. That is literally your job is to uphold the constitution, which protects our civil rights, our right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, make it happen. Mm. We know how to do it. We know what we need. We're mm -hmm. giving you a to-do list. And so this whole thing about the consent, I don't know. I'm, I'm coming in here open, totally open. Hmm. Do we keep it? Do we not? But I'll tell you this. If, if, I'm, if I'm having to sit and listen to a bunch of gaslighting tonight, my first reaction is, no, we're not ready. So I want you, yeah, I you. real I need you, and I want I you, thank you. I, I need you, and I want you, Julia, to continue to work with us, because that's the only way we're going to get it done. And we have to get it done in a way that we are articulate and, um, you know, powerful about our message. So I appreciate your comments tonight. I thank you. And I want you to please stay engaged. And where there are questions in the work that you're doing as I as I navigate my my new position, reach out to me. Let's figure it out. You know, let's figure it out. It doesn't have to be a hostile um, engagement. We can get the answers and we can push forward the message. And I appreciate you. Thank you so, very much. So that's, I, that's, I, I, that's my point with these meetings. You know, this is just my second one. But I, I, hey, I'm totally engaged in this community from all I, aspects. I will have to say, uh, I, I appreciate very much your, your introduction and, and giving us a very basic set of guidelines. And I'm also uh, recognizing the fact that these are very highly charged emotional events. And I want yes. to commend every single person on this call yes. for keeping themselves together and seeing their contribution as valuable to the greater good. And by being able to put and understand our emotional connection to this yes. issue is a, going to be of utmost importance when we are living in our in our truth and feelings as in our full humanity. We must yes. be able to accept the role Please. of emotions. So thank I look, you. I, appreciate I look it. forward to hearing from you. Yeah, and Felicia, okay. if I could really quickly too, yes. um, Julia, th thank you for that, right? I, I think one of the big challenges that in, in public policing just in the United States and Seattle, world and across the globe, is this disconnect from, you know, what we would call constitutional policing and human rights, right? Human rights needs to drive this and, and drive the future. And so I, I appreciate that. But second, I challenge you a bit as well. Uh, I heard you say that, that the experts here uh, can handle this. You're one, you have to become one of the experts. Mm. You are one. And when it comes to human rights, we have to start saying, what does that actually mean from a policy standpoint in policing, from mm -hmm. a practice standpoint, from a measurement standpoint? And what I, what I, what we desperately need is for you people like you with your brilliant ideas to step forward and say, let me translate human rights into policing mm -hmm. policy into policing measures, into policing strategy, whatever it may be, so that we can actually make that vision for the future reality. Um, and so I am hopeful that you'll be able to work with Felicia Absolutely. and us. Absolutely. And, and, and know I have you're going to be heard. a particular position of, of power and influence being in the chair that I am. But mm -hmm. I'm also speaking on behalf of those who whom I'm here that have not been able to join us tonight. And for, okay. uh, for those folks, I speak, um, I, I say this, it's your responsibility. Yeah. If it, because you, as the, as the institution, are connected to all aspects of it. You but have we gotta, access, we you have, have to more hear. information. Us, we, as the, us as a commission, our job yeah. and responsibility, which I'm committed to in response to both of everything that I've heard tonight, is to be able to continue to build the bridges mm -hmm. between ha the how to and the what. Absolutely. And that I'm very much looking forward to working with you and building uh, Ms. Felicia. So thank you. Absolutely. I, 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 I welcome the same sentiment. BJ, we have about 20 minutes left and we have probably six hands up. So BJ, I'm not cutting you off or shortening your, your point of view, but it's, you're next. 
Yep, no worries. I'll try to be brief on this one. Uh, I mean, Dr. Alftelli and the monitoring team have said that society has changed since the consent decree has come forward, and it's a baseline, and a lot of it really needs to come from the community. So due to time, this might not be a question for them to answer now, but I would like to get an answer, like, based on that, what's the monitoring team's process for figuring out, like, when they're going to oppose a change that comes from the community, whether that's Seattle City Council or the state legislature? Um, thinking of three things, like the ban on less lethal uh, weapons uh, from last summer that was struck down, uh, the holding SPD accountable for its overspend in 2020, uh, when there was opposition to that earlier this year, and at the state level, the fact that uh, I-940 does not apply to Seattle Police Department, I believe, largely due to the consent decree. Uh, and then just one other comment in terms of like the consent decree is supposed to be for constitutional policing. Uh, Dr. Artelli, you said 90% of stops right now are constitutional. So mm -hmm. that means that even after a decade of the consent decree, every 10th stop is currently unconstitutional. Uh, it's hard to see that as honestly, not really a massive issue and a failing after a decade. And especially given the uh, statistics that uh, Dr. Reverend Walden uh, mentioned with Seattle stopping uh, the African-American community and the indigenous community members at much higher rates, that means even with all this anti-bias training, it apparently hasn't worked because SPD is still stopping uh, certain communities at much higher rates. And every 10th stop effectively is unconstitutional. So a lot there, BJ. I, I wish we had another hour or two on because I think you had five, five or six different questions there on the on the uh, that you know those percentiles. We're still like working on that assessment, but but you're right in that what that shows is that there are still problems, right? Um, and that we'll have to determine the CPC, the monitoring team, collectively the city as to what to do about that going forward. It, it, one of the key questions will be in those areas where there's still problems. If there there are safe stops, for example, that are that are uh, that are not done well, they're not constitutional. What exactly happened with that stop uh, to have uh, SPD and the accountability partner CPC, OIG, OP to be looking at those, learning from them, flowing that back into policy, and in cases discipline. Uh, if it, you know, depending on what the type of mistake was, right? So none of this is ever going to be perfect. There is never a policing organization, a human services organization, a company, whatever it is, that will be perfect in every measure. So we have to figure out what that threshold is, all of us, and then figure out what do we do going forward with or without a consent decree to, to get it as perfect as possible, right? Knowing it never will be. Um, there, uh, kind of walking back to some of your other questions there, there are, you know, per, you know, purview, so to say, of what the, the federal consent decree, uh, um, can, you know, can work on in Seattle and things that are that are up to the legislative branch, the elected officials, right? And if there are areas, um, the, the consent decree says in it that, that the city of Seattle can pursue innovation, can pursue new forms of policy and practice and policing, can set up new policing uh, systems and alternative response, all of that is fine. And so it's up to the legislature and the city to, to design those, to develop them, uh, to work them through and, and to enact those. If only, if there's only instances where if, for example, one of those mechanisms or policies contradicts or is, is, sets up something to be non-constitutional, would uh, the courts or the monitor team intervene in that and help to resolve that particular issue. So there's a lot of leeway, a lot of innovation that can happen from the city directly on its own um, that is, is welcome and should be happening completely. It, it, all the stuff around reimagining, for example, uh, needs to, even more needs to be done in that um, and at a faster clip or even. So i um, not sure if that's exactly answering your question on that, but the, but there's a lot of discretion there the city has, of course, to, to work um, in those areas. Um, the, I'm trying to recall your other questions here, but um... I just wanted to correct one question. There was a, there was one uh, about 940 not applying to the city of Seattle. Um, 948 does apply to the city of Seattle. Just you asked if it did or not. It does apply to the city of Seattle. There was a request um, um, asked about Seattle being exempted because of the consent decree. That request was denied. Um, and additionally, the new Office of Independent Investigations will take over the functions um, from 940. So the, sp the specifics around 940 were that um, law enforcement agencies could not investigate themselves in a lethal use of force shooting. 
Um, and so uh, another jurisdiction would have to do that investigation. The Office of Independent Investigations that was passed this year will further that by saying that um, there will be a completely separate agency. So if you have an agreement with a neighboring agency to do that investigation, those will no longer uh, be in place that um, lethal use of force will be um, investigated by an entirely separate entity. And that entity is intended to move to a um, civilian uh, led body and a civilian investigation body um, as we go through the next few years. So. Um, uh, certified uh, officers will be phased out um, in favor of an exclusively civilian investigative body over the course of a number of years. Um, and so that that's where that goes, but Seattle has no exemptions from that. BJ, you may have had a couple other questions there uh, if you wanna remind us what those were, sorry. Uh, and I'd prefer to yield time for other community members to chime in. Thank you, BJ. Uh, Amy? Yeah, hi. Um, I have a question about um, some recent reporting in the South Seattle Emerald. Um, there is an article recently by Carolyn Bick about um, a recent OPA DCM about the um, SPOG uh, headquarters protest on Labor Day on, in 2020. Um, uh, I don't know if everyone's familiar with this article, but it, it kind of blew my mind. Um, and basically, I, I'm just going to quote a little bit to give you a sense of what it's talking about. It's this throws into question the claim that SPD's aim was not to disperse the crowd, but only to target one person allegedly carrying a dangerous weapon for arrest. However, the OPA appears to ignore this and further appears to convey a specific reason for doing so. The OPA writes in the DCM that it declines to reach a conclusion that under the federal consent decree would legally bar SPD from policing demonstrations because the OPA claims that these protest situations could become dangerous without police. For that reason, the OPA writes, it will not sustain this allegation. So, I mean, what I'm getting from this is that there's been this construction of a fictional narrative of what happened that day at the protest that the OPA is is signing off on so that it won't have to go before before you, the monitor, and before the judge. Um, and I feel like um, instead of instead of actually wanting to know the truth of what happened, and I feel like that is very undermining of the basic purpose of the OPA's existence. And then it, it erodes community trust um, because if we see something like this, then then we have to dig into every single finding the OPA gives knowing that perhaps it's not accurate and it has some political reason behind it. So I guess my question is, as the federal monitor, um, what, is, what is your response to hearing that the consent decree is being used in this way to avoid accountability for SPD? Uh, so Amy, I'm gonna have to probably get back to you on that just I have not read that article. Um, I do know that um, one, just at a, at a somewhat of a personal level, that that particular incident was just disgusting. Uh, that that night, um, the actions that uh, took place at uh, via Spog, and I, I've talked with um, Mike Solon about that. And just uh, what I do know, though, is that the that in the Sentinel event review process that OIG is running, they are looking. They're in a, they're in a phase right now where they will be looking directly at that particular incident um, from a systemic standpoint to understand what uh, what went wrong, what happened, et cetera, and to have findings. Now, OIG's Sentinel event review looks at things more from a systemic lens to say, how can we prevent this from happening again in the future? It doesn't look at things from a disciplinary lens. So one thing I'll have to do, and maybe Monisha, if you have any insight on this, please chime up, but is to go back and reread that article to see, um, and also kind of review what the OPA finding was on that. Um, and we may have to circle back on, on that because I, I wasn't aware of the linkage or the, um, um, you know, the exact details you're, you're referencing on this. Apologies on that, but we can definitely look yeah, at it. Yeah, I, I would love it if you could circle back. And I will say further that, I mean, there's the whistleblower issue in the OIG right now as well. So we have multiple problems that I think are compounding to further erode trust. 
So it looks like we may have to have you guys back again because <laughs> we have about 10 minutes left. This time went by really fast. <laughs> I was worrying about um, whether or not we will have enough, enough um, content for the meeting, but it looks like we are um, doing quite well with it. Amy, please uh, stay tuned. Um, we will get back to you with, with the answers to your questions. Uh, Mother Walden, you had, um, did you have a question? I see your hand up. I had a question. I had a comment about Charlena. As a black woman, we actually, we are, I mean, we were all uh, uh, highly concerned about that case. And I want to push back when people said that we didn't say anything. I, uh, I mentioned more than once about what would happen on an out of policy takedown. An out of policy takedown with the, that's not in policy, would the officer still have a job? Would he, would he get fired for breaking policy? And Charlene allows at 97 pounds or 94 pounds I, 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 in a crisis, I, I was a case where an out of policy takedown would have saved her life. And I've been advocating on the mothers, and I did, we talked about that at the CPC, an out of policy takedown. What does it look like for an officer to be able to make a out of policy takedown, be able to save the person's lives, but it's not part of policy? Will that officer still have a job uh, I, or, or not have a job? So anyway, I just wanted to make clarification on that because people start sounding like we, we didn't work on that case. We were highly, highly, we were highly affected by that. We even had, I mean, we have organized we, uh, with the, uh, I think the ACLU and we were all out there at the, uh, at the U and black women got to speak first. I hear a lot of people talking about Charlene Lyles, but I want to talk about it as a black woman. Okay. And I heard Julia and I understand her and I greatly hear her voice, but a lot of people get in line. Okay. But we were highly affected as black women and especially knowing that she was pregnant and also she could have been my daughter or my granddaughter. So I just wanted to clarify and I want to talk about it. I want to put out a po out of policy takedown. And uh, and in some cases, we could have had a poly an out of policy takedown and the individual could have gotten up to Harborview to, uh, for, for an assessment. And then Charlene allows this case, I mean, uh, you know, when that name comes up, and especially people who have never been out in the community. A lot of people talking tonight, I mean, you know, and they are in line and stuff, but they have never been out in the community. They were not in any of those forms for, you know, out, out at the U, have not showed up for a lot of things. And so a lot of people have a lot of comment. But from a voice who's been in the community, we were highly affected by Charlie Niles. And uh, we have been working on that and to see what an out-of-policy takedown would look like and what would happen uh, uh, with the officers out-of-policy takedown. Thank you. Thank you, Mother. Did you guys have any comment? Okay. Uh, Jason, Jason. Oh, I'm sorry, Paul. I'm sorry, yeah, Paul. No, Go right ahead. Okay. Yeah. I mean, we, it, we, we only have about uh, nine minutes left. So please. perfect. Um, so, uh, you know, I've, I've been listening patiently and also mm -hmm. um, the last comments really are, are pertain to my, to my comment where um, you know, I'm my concern as a community member, as someone in South Seattle who has had to call um, 911 um, when I have seen individuals on a couple occasions with mental health, health crises or um, vulnerable individuals. Um, uh, and, and my concern is that, um, you know, it seems like and I've seen from the Crosscut article that that uh, police officers um, Involuntary commitments have dropped 45 percent over the last four years, um, specifically related to um, House Bill 1310, and and the sense that I'm I'm also concerned that the statistics that have been reported tonight, you know, are are basically reflecting um, kind of a more hands off approach when police officers engage with folks, and there isn't a crisis um, intervention team available. And so they walk away. And so my concern is that the community is is not benefiting from um, this this hands off approach from the police. And I'd like to see kind of ways in which that they can engage in order to to engage more fully with folks like, for instance, Charlena, and and ways in which the police feel more enabled to take a risk 
and maybe the statistic goes up, but they're actually engaging in serving the community better. And so that's been one of my great concerns as I've watched this. I work in, currently on the King County Regional Homelessness Authority. Um, mm -hmm. And as we, we move forward to engaging with individuals on, in the community on the street um, who have mental health, behavioral health um, issues and concerns and trauma, um, I would love to see ways in which we allow for a systemic change to, to increase officers' willingness to really lean into some, some of these engagements. And so I just don't, I want to hear from the monitor and, and from Felicia, your, your thoughts on that. Um, yeah, so I guess my, my response is, uh, one, it's, it's a wonderful question and as well as advocacy on this particular issue. The, um, from the consent decree standpoint, uh, purely again, kind of going back to those baseline things we had talked about, um, the goal from the consent decree was to, was to have SPD train, uh, develop new policy and train to reduce use of force uh, in areas around, for, for, for people in crisis, right? So it's a very basic um, set of policy understandings and measures on that. When it comes to re-articulating or redesigning the policy, the practices for what should come next, I, I think that would be probably part of, you know, the, the discussions around reimagining policing. Um, it's a I think we could help the monitoring team could help technically assist with those types of you know future revisions and policy, um, but it would have to likely be driven by by you guys by a CPC um, to say what should the policies look like um, in the future. Um, can we put those you know in place? Can we sync those up with the uh, with the consent decree? Maybe if the consent decree can give some some heft to that uh, and move those forward that way. Yeah, thanks. I mean, I just would love for individual police officers to have a, 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 an avenue to be able to say to themselves, I, I really should intervene instead of walking away um, right. and have an avenue to be able to kind of say, what do I need in place for me to take a risk to intervene and, you know, not kind of feel some of that liability that, that may kind of really put the public more at risk. Interesting too. I mean, just one more comment on that, Paul, because Felicia, I know we're running late on mm -hmm. time here. But what is fascinating about what you're saying, Paul, is that there is this, uh, you know, kind of the policy side in that both puts a, a floor and somewhat of a, of a ceiling, even if it's a perceived ceiling on some officer actions. And it interacts, I think, with 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 culture, right? And even back earlier to um, uh, to the points that Julia made around human rights. You know, can we develop policies, particularly for people that are in crisis, whether it's an alternative response or if it's a CIT trained officer, where they can have some, some, I guess I would say like better discretion, right? Better range of options in order to have the best outcome from that. And that's a really fascinating uh, discussion. You know, we should do some ideation on that, you know, design some policy and would love to have you work on that with us. Okay, uh, let's go with Jason and then Jake and Braxton, and then um, that should take up. We got we only have two minutes, so I want to be respectful of people's time because I do want you to come back. Go Thank ahead, you very Jake. Much. I'll go. I'll go quickly. Um, I just actually wanted to follow up on uh, I think it was Amy's comment uh, and question. Um, uh, at the tail end of it, she mentioned a whistleblower complaint. Uh, that was filed uh, that detailed some serious allegations about how the Office of Inspector General is in fact not uh, taking its job of, of uh, supervising the OPA and doing systemic oversight seriously and is instead uh, trying to basically uh, uh, cozy up with the OPA, protect the OPA, uh, values personal relationships with the OPA uh, more than the OIG. So I guess my question to the monitor would be, are you aware of that complaint? Uh, and are you aware of Carolyn, Carolyn Bick's reporting of that complaint in the South, uh, South Seattle Emerald? And what do you see uh, the monitor's role uh, in terms of being independent outside of the city? Uh, not, you know, because right now the city is investigating it, but it's kind of the city investigating its own agency. Is there a way for the monitor um, to come in 
and actually get to the bottom of what's going on there. Uh, so I guess that'd be the question is one, are you aware of it? Are you aware of the depth? And then two, what do you see your role as? Yeah, Jason, thanks for that. I, I, I am aware of it. the monitoring team is aware. We've been kind of, I guess, um, well, monitoring the situation. Um, it's not directly in our purview to, to, to look at that from, uh, you know, from a standpoint of, of, you know, what we do as a monitoring team is like advise the court on progress relative to the consent decree, right? Requirements in the consent decree, which are mostly based in SPD. The accountability structures, um, whether it's from the, the ordinance that was set up 2017 or from originally, because, you know, CPC, for example, came out of the consent decree, um, we're limited in what we can do in, for like investigations in that no matter. Um, but that being said, I let me you know, uh, talk to the team and, and work with you guys to see what, if any, leverage we have there to do a little bit more look under the hood. Um, I know the court would likely be interested in, in this, of course, and has been, uh, has been expressed interest in it. So um, I can't give you a strong, you know, answer on this right now, but other than that, we will, we, we can look into that and get back to you on that. Okay. Quickly. Uh, Thank you. Um, I want to characterize uh, the frustration we're hearing tonight um, comes, I don't know, has many many uh, centuries built up. It came to a head almost 10 years ago when we asked for federal intervention, when the federal government had to come in and try to sort that out the mess asked by the administration to, to help I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Um, we can't. We can't. Can, can you? Uh, I'm sorry. Drake. Drake. I apologize. We can't. We still have this. Hello. 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 I don't, I don't Hello. think. Jake yeah. Jake. Jake. This is really Jake. It's really, we have all this alphabet soup of. I can't. Of monitoring each other. And for yes, some, can you help me? because the way it's set up. Hey, Jake, Jake, can you hear me? Jake, we, we cannot we can't, hear you We all. can't hear, we can't hear you. Can you please uh, email me your question and I will get it over to the monitors because we really are out of time and we can't hear you. So my question is, can I ask a question? Yeah, but we can't hear you. You're breaking up really bad. <laughs> Can't hear, can't hear, forget it. We can't hear or try you. Try to turn off your camera. Sometimes turning off your camera helps. It, it didn't help. Just go on to Braxton. Just, okay. we can't hear. We can't, so. Hi, I'm here, I'm here. It's I'm going to lay. I'm here. It's important. I can hear you, I can hear you. yeah? We can't hear you. I'm here. You're breaking up. You're breaking up really Can you hear me? No. Braxton, go right ahead, and then uh, that will be the last question. Uh, I'll talk to you after. Braxton? Hello? Can okay. you hear me? Yes. Thank you. All right. So, I mean, first and foremost, okay. what I want Thank to you. say, which I think is uh, most important, is, you know, I'm not sure if, like, the reasoning why we need to have a 8, 8 p.m. cutoff time, uh, but I feel like these meetings don't come as frequently as they should. And there's always a CPC meetings, but those are uh, very inconvenient at 9 a.m. when a lot of people are working or in school or doing, you know, their day-to-day -day lives. Mm -hmm. So I see like four or five other hands in there, and I don't think it would take that much more of everyone's time to, 
to stay and listen to them. Obviously, for people who have to go, they can go. But for people who are able to stay and dedicated two hours of their time to hopefully have their voice heard, I feel like it's an extreme disservice to them okay. to to not continue, first and foremost. Um, secondly, going, going back to the OIG, um, going back to that OIG whistleblower case, um, mm -hmm. I guess my question before I continue, and I really like just an abbreviated answer is, what uh, what stance has the CPC taken on that uh, on that article, and what have they come out to say um, about what was reported about the OIG whistleblower and basically the OPA getting cozy with the uh, Seattle police and the OIG in tandem getting cozy with the OPA? Has the CPC said anything and made a comment? Is there anybody, uh, Jesse, or can you speak to that or? I don't know if I have anybody because, I, as I said, I'm new to the CP, CPC. Um, Reverend Wallen can speak on it. I okay, mean, go right ahead, Reverend Wallen. This in community meeting is that this complaint is under ethics. Uh, the CL, uh, ethics committee, I mean, uh, I, I, I commission is uh, investigating that, and we have no. I, I, and, the, and the policy of the CPC is that when something is being investigated, we, as soon as the ethics committee, I, 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 I commission finished their investigation and issued their finding, then we will have something to say. I mean, and we said that already. I mean, I said that, I think, uh, I think our director, uh, our executive director, uh, uh, Randy uh, Grant, Ms. Grant did, uh, did say that. Uh, uh, and uh, I think we've, uh, uh, we said it numerous times, so this will be so this will be like the fourth time we've said that because it comes up uh, often. Uh, but uh, the whistleblower was there, the article was there, and uh, and the ethics committee, the ethics uh, commission, uh, is investigating that complaint. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, okay. um, Renee. I see your hand, and then this. I is actually wasn't finished. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, sorry. Real briefly, take yeah. 15 seconds. Um, but I just want to say that we are. A lot of us are eagerly waiting for that formal, uh, for that formal statement from the CPC and from the Seattle Monitor. And I just pray to God that this is not something that gets swept under the rug and is just forgotten about because it won't be forgotten about by the city of Seattle. And at this point, we're seeing two of the three pillars of the Seattle accountability system just basically fail to hold up their end of the bargain and to, in other words, choose the police over the community. And the CPC is the last group that's able to have a stance on that. And so I just want to say, please have a strong, bold stance. Do not spare the OIG. Do not spare the OPA. Do not spare anybody for any political reasons whatsoever, because basically your response will determine how the community will feel even furthermore about who is actually on our side, who's representing the community and who's representing the police and whose uh, best interest do you have in mind. So please take it extremely seriously. I know that you all are, but uh, this is something that I do want to see a formal response from the CPC and not, as, not any commissioner who will you know, say, I think it's messed up as themselves individually, but we want a, we want a strong response from the CPC themselves as an entity denouncing uh, d denouncing everything that was talked about in that uh, formal ethics complaint. So just letting you know that that's something that's going on. Okay. Braxton, just, no, if I could just want one thing with yeah. that too, that uh, to augment one of my previous comments is that the via the CPC uh, going into the 2022 monitoring plan, if, if the community wants the monitor around uh, in, you know, the federal court, uh, the, the, you know, federal oversight in the next year, meaning that if the, if the, you know, the city would have to move to close it out, but it, for 2022, if the CPC said, here are policies and changes that directly are related to accountability within those accountability systems, we could put those into the 2022 monitoring plan, right? So if there are changes, if there were things that happened with that incident, and we could identify changes that need to be made to the accountability system in order to, to do that, there are, there are routes to that, whether it's via city council with some type of accountability you know, bill, or maybe technically if it was in a 2022 monitoring plan, there may be things we could do there with that as well if there was something found. Thank you. Renee, really quickly. Yes, thank you for letting me speak and extending the time. I will be very brief. Please. Uh, talked a lot tonight about how the consent decree isn't working and the immense harm and systemic racism inherent in SPD. 
We've also talked about the need for future and alternative solutions. And I wanna strongly encourage the CPC to endorse the solidarity budget. It's a community driven blueprint for divesting from policing and investing in true safety and community care. And it's been endorsed by over a hundred community groups. And I encourage this group to sign on as well. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we're two minutes over time. I, I apologize for that, but at the same time, I'm appreciative of all the engagement. Are there any last comments from our uh, commission or our monitoring team that you would like to make? Um, I, I, would, I would like to talk. Uh, can I comment? I don't know why my raised hand got taken down, but I'm, I'm here and I've been here for an hour and a half and I would like to comment. Go ahead really quickly. Thank you. So I'm sort of wondering here, I'm a little bit confused because we're hearing like what, it, for me, what has been the point of this consent decree? Because all I've heard of the last year is people are using the consent decree as an excuse for why SPD can't ban tear gas, for why SPD can't be defunded because it all has to go through the monitor, but we don't have to go through a consent decree if we want to defend our schools. We don't have to go through the consent decree if we want any of these things. And honestly, we talk about the CPC and the monitors, but it seems like CE from South Seattle and Wolf is kind of doing your job for you. She seems to be the only one that's hitting all the complaints and actually doing any accountability here. And even, even from the basic things, like even if let's say you were really pushing against OIG, I'm a little bit confused what sort of power the CPC actually has. And I would really love some answers here. Finally, I have one last question for the court monitor, which is, were you tear gas last June? Thank you. Um, so that was the last question was, was I personally tear gas last June? Yes. Uh, no, I have not. multiple friends who have PTSD and are still throwing physical and and emotional effects from the last summer. People who were beaten up by cops, people who had cops brutally slam um, slam bikes into them, people who were arrested and dragged, people who were exposed to COVID, people who had their homes thrown away. Okay. Real yeah. world people are having consequences. Okay, thank you, Sam. So go ahead, go ahead. Uh, I'll let you go ahead and finish that. Yeah, no, Dr. Sam. Thank, th thank you for that. And it's this is important, Sam, because it's just even if you haven't been at these meetings before, it's important for people to keep coming forward and you know yeah. and, and raising. I have been to many of these meetings before. Wonderful. Good, good. Um, I'm, I'm relatively new, <laughs> but I do have, I do have empathy from, you know, I was in Minneapolis during uh, much of the protests and um, have been experiencing that. And I have real world experience with it. Oh. <laughs> um, the um, one, I think one thing I'll just say on that is it, if you, if you do have incidents that have not been reported somehow to uh, you should, right. Uh, OPA received about 18,000 <laughs> Roughly, I think uh, um, incidents, right? If there are more, we should we should put more into the system. Um, and if as, as we look at those, you know, as OPA looks at those, if the findings, uh, if we see there's systemic problems with how those resolved, then uh, that that's something that CPC should uh, uh, you know, could work on with the monitoring team. Right? <laughs> so um, so that's as well as the Sentinel event review is going forward on that. Um, and we're uh, the monitor team is is looking at that as well, and so we are still we're leaning in very heavily on what happened with uh, um, you know, with the situation in 2020, and um, uh, you know going to try and address that as, as much as we can. Um, there you had a bunch a bunch of other questions there around CPC. I, I don't know. If yeah, should... um, looks like we will have to have you guys back. Um, I didn't realize it would be such a robust conversation. So I and we, we are happy to come back as, <laughs> as much as possible. Um, uh, Monisha and Ron and I, and, and so we'd be more than happy to do that. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, I wanna thank everybody for all of the participation tonight. Um, and Sam, just to let you know, this is the second meeting I've had as director of community engagement. And the meetings are, scheduled for the second Tuesday of every month from six to eight. And so I welcome you all to come back again. I welcome you all to email me at felicia.cross at seattle.gov um, with any topics or any, um, any, any information that you wanna um, receive. Um, 
this is our meeting and whether we agree or disagree or agree to disagree, this is our meeting. And so this is where we are um, able to hear and listen and participate in this whole process in this whole procedure. So I wanna thank all of you. Um, and for those of you who I did not get a chance to hear your questions, please email me. We will follow up and whatever topic you wanna have next, let me know. And this is, I uh, wanna say thank you again for, for participating tonight. And thank you for going over time. Thank you, Monisha. Thank you, uh, um, Dr. Uh, uh, Telly. Antonio is fine. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Ron. Thank you all for being here. Good Thanks night. For the time. Thanks, everyone. Looking forward to talking again. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good night. Mm. Yeah. Good night. <laughs>